But what I'm going to focus on is why um, a number of reasons why we think we have to be in the cloud space for the research that we want to do, in, and in particular related to data integration. So that's that's really um, at least in theory, you can do sequence analysis outside the clouds. Everybody's finding it much more convenient to do it inside. But it is so hard to do anything in data integration outside a space where you can hold all these publicly available data sets that you might want to use as part of the integration, as well as really large additional interior, you know, sort of local data sets that you're, you're trying to integrate. And I'm going to give some concrete examples of that and talk a little bit um, about that part of the idea of how it can be. So, this is all predicated on what, what drives the need to do data integration is that getting to the understanding of the underlying genetic architecture for common diseases and complex human traits is not what we expected. So we certainly all hoped at the beginning that when we would find things for common disease using an architecture metaphor, there would be lots of things as big as the Sears Tower. There would be lots of things as big as the Standard Oil Building or whatever they call it these days. And there would be lots of apartment complex sized buildings, you know, that would that would be formidable structures. And what we have instead is not that. We have little bitty things indistinguishable one from another. And in the space of genome translation, these little finds, we, we, most, of the, most of the heritability for common disease lies in relatively common variants with small effect sizes located largely in non-coding sequence and about regulation in some way rather than amino acid polymorphisms or truncated mutations that change the nature of a protein we're talking about DNA variants, mostly non-coding, that alter the timing of protein production, or the amount of protein produced, or what happens, how much protein gets produced in response to a particular environmental stimulus. So, and so at that level, you can see the need for bringing a lot more information together. A lot, a lot of information on contributing variants considered more globally, and information on how to annotate function in the genome with respect to regulation. And it's wrong to think that we can't get a lot of information from lots of small effects. And this is a great example of data integration that conveys you know, clear meaning, um, and it involves simply the, the first two principal components on very large numbers of common variants um, studied in populations across Europe, individuals from populations across Europe. And you see, you know, just by, by tilting the axis slightly off of a sort of a natural perpendicular, you get a beautiful map of Europe corresponding very much to the actual European map based on these first two principal components from you know, hundreds of thousands of DNA variants that collect each individual one tells you very little about anything. But collectively, there's a lot of information in pulling together the effects of many small contributing factors for something like this. And so this is the idea to use as much as we can to get as much information together as we can on these things. And, and so this is, for us, a major driver of the need to be in a cloud space. And this is wrong. It takes three weeks to download TCG data at 10 gigabytes per second, right? I mean, and so three weeks, if you've got access to really fast things and have something in your personal lab big enough to hold these data, which is and the thing is, you don't want to use just TCGA data. 
we want to use all kinds of other things at the same time with TCGA to do our science. Because at this point in time, we are aggressively integrating sort of over many different omics dimensions because that means we have to. Because to get anything at all, this is what we're going to have to do. So you, you have to be in that space. And we're trying to build tools that make it easier for other people to, to integrate their own omics data in this way, in the cloud, so because you know, it's, it's so much easier for people to port these tools to the, the right clouds for use. And, and so we're trying to focus on building tools and portals that are cloud-based for people to use. And, and we're going to do think that some of these tools, um, especially in the context of something like TCGA data, could ultimately have clinical utility. You know, I'll try to draw an example of that. You know, in the context of prediction, prognosis, outcomes um, for individual cancer patients. So, so the idea would be that you know, somebody out there has a patient and they know that using TCGA data, GTEx data, thousand genomes data, that we've built some tools that could allow them to get some better information about their patient. And so they, they could just pour that data right into uh, open Science Data Cloud here, run their analysis on the patient and pull it down. And so, you know, geneticists have always been interested in both under using genetics as a tool to pry into underlying biology, a kind of a dissection of the contributing factors to a disease, understanding the etiology of complex traits, understanding the mechanisms that are used by the genetic variation to drive phenotype. And of course you get to things like durable targets to potentially identify modifiable environmental factors that are important parts of gene-environment interaction that we can use to alter risk for disease. But, but we are also in the prediction space and we want to know who's likely to develop these. We, we want to be able to do risk stratification. We want to think about intervention strategies, modifying environments that reduce the likelihood of developing disease, particularly in individuals most likely to develop the disease. We'd like to prevent adverse events um, from drug therapies and other kinds of therapies. And you know, especially for diseases where how rapidly you get a, pa a patient really treated by like cancer, for example, we'd like to know which patients are going to respond to which regimens the best. And you want to know that before you start things. I mean, really, you know, if you've got cancer, you don't want to fool around with treatments that are not going to be effective for you. So one of the big spaces that we have been playing in since, so this is not the slide that I've seen. I don't know. Yeah, okay. The, the spaces where we play is the um, genotype tissue expression study. So this is a common fund initiative. So NHGRI has partnered with many other institutes to develop this initiative where um, primarily organ donors, but some patients also at autopsy, have agreed to participate in these studies where um, tissues are collected, about 50 tissues are collected, as well as blood samples. Um, and we do whole genome sequencing on the blood samples and then we do RNA seq. We not we. Somebody does RNA seq on all the tissues. And then many of us are funded to analyze these data and to develop methods for using these data in the context of trying to get a better understanding of genomics. It's big data. This is whole genome sequence data on the subjects. It's RNA seq on 50 tissues in all of these samples. So it's a it's, it's big data and hosted in the cloud, right? So, so we can have these data available to us on tissues from, you know, these people have died, so they're, they're not what you call healthy, although some of them are accident victims, but they die of all the things that people die of. And we don't take organs, for example, that were the source of a cancer that killed a person. 
So there, you can think of these as more or less normal tissues. Um, a primary driver of this was to get at what are called PQTLs. These are expression quantitative trait loci, which is a jargon name in genetics. But it just means DNA variants that are associated with transcript levels, which is what we measure with RNA-seq, right? So we're measuring messenger RNA transcript levels um, in, in all of these tissues. And so we just want to find the DNA variants that are highly significantly associated with these transcript levels. So that's part of the product of GTEx. But, but what I'm going to talk more about are new ways that we've developed to integrate results of studies in GTEx with large-scale sequencing studies, other uh, large-scale genomic studies. Uh, and a key reason for why we have GTEx as a resource now and why our group and others funded in this initiative are so interested in integrating all this information is that it turns out that for now essentially all common diseases that people have looked at, much of the common variant heritability is actually can be shown to be attributable to what we measure as DNA variants associated with regulation at the level of expression. It can be up to half or even 60% of all heritability that we can estimate from DNA variation is associated with this kind of regulation. And even when it's you know, maybe only 30 or 40%, this is only part of the entire regulation space. Because of course, proteins themselves are regulated and um, groups here are assaying proteins in high throughput and that will eventually become part of the data in GTEx as well. It's being done in many different tissues through the enhanced GTEx project. There's, there's regulation through methylation status at sites very regulated. And so all of those things can come into the space of explaining how it is that human diseases develop. And it looks like this is most of what drives common diseases are the common variants that affect regulation in all these different ways. So, and there's been a lot of methods development to, to get at this, and we and others have developed large-scale tools for prediction, um, including prediction across omics. So we've been focused on really trying to do this not just with, say, genome sequence variation, but also the transcriptome information, methylation information, all simultaneously. Um, and, and we actually can get into the, it's kind of another slide coming, we actually get close to clinical utility with just the genomics alone for some phenotypes. It's coming. So everybody who does the, develops these prediction tools always tries them out first in type 1 diabetes um, because as shown here with our omic creeping approach, but, but actually there are now other methods that can do nearly as well as, as, as we do here with the omic creeping. Um, you're, in, you're in clinical utility. If we had a way of preventing type 1 diabetes, we could find with just a cheap genome chip that costs $55, we could predict who was, would benefit from that preventive therapy. We could take all kids, give them this $55 biobanking chip, and decide who, whose risk for type 1 diabetes was so high that they would benefit from prevention therapies to, to allow them to avoid developing this disease. And you can see we're not there um, for many other common diseases, but this is just based on, on genome variation. And not all traits are as heritable as type 1 diabetes. Um, and Nobody says we only have we, we have to use only genomics. We can use lots of other things, and you can substantially improve these predictions when you go across omics and when you go across other pieces of information like um, electronic health records. So patterns of healthcare usage, for example, are really good at helping identify people who are going to develop bipolar disorder, which has a seven-year diagnostic odyssey. If you combine patterns of healthcare usage with the genetic data, you can probably do nearly as well 
as we can do with genetics alone in time to type on diabetes. One of, the, one of the things I want to talk about is that we're, we're using GTEx and, and actually making all of this available through the cloud is something that a young faculty member here has come up with. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an idea that takes a while to wrap your mind around. It's a fantastic idea. It's more of a systems-based approach to doing genomic studies. Um, and it, so this is developed out of GTEx. It's now submitted to Nature Genetics as a GTEx companion paper. The idea is if we start with, oh, with gene expression that we measure, like transcriptome studies, and we think about a, a simple decomposition, there's the part that is completely driven by genome variation. So it's genetically determined regulation. And then there's some part that is definitely driven by environmental exposures that alter gene expression. So exterior things uh, that we eat, that we are exposed to through breathing, sun rays, whatever, I mean other exposures. And the combination of the genetically predicted expression and what happens based on exposures will sometimes lead to disease. And the disease process itself will feed back on gene expression and alter, alter gene expression. And so part of what we measure as gene expression it is, has to do with feedback that uh, reflects the innate genetics, the exterior exposures, and then the complex interaction of how that drives our biology and physiology feeding back on gene expression. So what, what hockey's done is to use the these really sophisticated prediction approaches in reference data sets to build predictors of gene expression, large-scale predictors of gene expression. For any of you who know anything about genome imputation, it's, it's exactly analogous to <coughs> genome imputation. In genome imputation, you have some reference sample, for example, that's fully sequenced, and you use that data to learn the relationships among DNA variants all over the genome, how correlated they are, so that in some new test sample where you only have a subset of those genome variants actually genotyped, you can use the correlation patterns that you learned for the full sequence data and the patterns you observe in just this test set to impute untyped variants um, all over the genome. So by, for example, genotyping about a million SNPs, but using, say, the 1,000 genomes reference samples, you can get about 7.5 million high-quality SNPs um, imputed in a data set. So it's a, it's a very effective technique. The idea here is exactly the same. Think of it this way. We use GTEx as the reference sample, where we have complete genome sequence data and RNA transcript levels. We use GTEx to learn the relationship between the genetic variation and the expression phenotypes. We build those predictors. We do that separately within each GTEx tissue. And we have that stored in a database on open science data commons. And then we can take that, that reference set of predictors that are just associated with SNP genotypes and for any data where we just have SNP genotypes, no measured expression, we can predict the gene expression phenotypes for any relevant tissues. And so then, given the predicted expression phenotypes, you can ask whether, so in a gene-based test, what genes are implicated in this disease because their predicted expression levels are significantly different in cases of controls. It's a gene-based test. It comes with mechanism, it's all about gene expression, and has direction, which is what you need to go to drug therapies if you want to modulate risk, right? So it's a, a very cool, more systems-based approach, has much higher power than other gene-based approaches. This is just showing that the quality of the prediction that we get is quite good. So the best case scenario um, when we're considering RNA-seq data is when we measured, we actually measured RNA, the, the RNA expression models, 
in the same samples, in say two different experiments. That's telling you about sort of experimental error in the RNA seq experiments. And that's what we're showing here is the correlation between observed levels in a set of samples measured in two different experiments. So this is just the, the correlation there. So now here we have the prediction R squared. So this is developing predictors in one sample, applying it in a completely different sample. And you can see we have very large numbers of genes where the, the prediction is quite good. Um, and so more than half the genes meet an FDR criteria for the significance of the predicted R squared, um, uh, an FDR less than 0 0.05. And the larger the uh, reference set where we build the predictions, the, the more genes we have that make really good um, criteria for prediction quality. So the idea is you start with, you know, once you've built these predictors in a reference sample, um, so we, we start with genetic data, and we use the predictors to predict gene expression over the whole genome, you know, for each gene in the genome that, that's really expressed in that, in whatever tissue is relevant. And then we correlate the predicted expression of phenotype. And, you know, we, there's we replication studies and validation studies in model systems. There are all kinds of ways to show that, that what we get is real. But the point is we don't need the transcriptome data to really do this. Only the genotype and phenotype data are needed. Lots of people have tried to use transcriptome information to get to the genes that drive common disease by, for example, looking at, say, an asthma patients doing transcriptome studies from whole blood in cases versus controls. And there are thousands and thousands of genes with highly significantly different expression in those studies. And that's mostly a consequence of disease and not a cause. This has no reverse causality. Expression, disease is not going to change this predicted expression because it's based strictly on the genome variation, right? It has all the advantages of any gene-based test in that you're testing only 10,000 genes expressed in a given tissue, not 7.5 million SNPs that you get by imputation, or 20 million SNPs that you get by direct sequencing. And the mechanism is, so we don't, there's no question about mechanism. This is about expression. We know the mechanism. We know the direction of effects. In the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, there were a couple of SNPs in the HLA region that in just that one GWAS set met genome-wide criteria for significance. There are dozens of genes by this test that meet genome-wide criteria for significance. Yes, plenty of them are in the HLA region, but this is new biological information because nobody realized until now that some of those SNPs were associated with the expression of genes in the HLA region. In addition, there are three new genes, two of which have really obvious biology. And so again, so, we, so we, in just a small GWAS, we've got new biology with this methodology that you couldn't possibly get with um, individual SNP studies. So this is a gene involved in the processing of class 1 MHC peptides, which is what we, this signal is about. So here's a gene on a different chromosome that's implicated in that same biology. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is uh, an autoimmune disease, as is type 1 diabetes. And so here we have a gene already implicated in type 1 diabetes, which has huge shared architecture. The autoimmune diseases, what's a mystery is why people get different autoimmune diseases, because so much of the genetic architecture is shared across all autoimmune um, so the fact that, that this one's already implicated in type 1 diabetes, where there are many more samples that have been studied, and we're, we're seeing it in this GWAS and rheumatoid arthritis, suggests yes, it's a rheumatoid arthritis is up to the region as well. Um, this, this is the QQ plot for this predict scan gene-based test against sort of the best gene-based test out on the market today, Vegas. So Vegas, you can see, has almost no excess signal within a single GWAS. And, and this is entirely the HLA signal. And that's because the recognition of genes can lie at some distance from them. Vegas is, is just 
using all the SNPs in a gene to come up with a sort of a gene-based assessment of the association of DNA variation with that gene. This mechanistic one has much more signal. And the point is you can take out the entire chromosome 6 region, so a lot of this is driven by chromosome 6 HLA region. You can take chromosome 6 out and we still have way more signal, way more genes with much better evidence for association using this test um, than with Vegas. In fact, if you look at something like Crohn's disease, shoot, I'm, I'm running a little bit over, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fast. If you look at something like Crohn's disease where, so we, we did this study in Just the Welcome Trust, lots of the genes that we see as um, so either genome-wide significant or nearly so for Crohn's disease turn out to be genes that have been established as risk factors for Crohn's disease by now in meta-analyses on tens of thousands of subjects. So anything above this line shows a really significant enrichment of our top signals from a single GWAS with known real genes for Crohn's disease. We see that with Crohn's, but we don't see it, for example, with hypertension. And the predictors, in this case, were built in whole blood. That may not be the right tissue for hypertension. And, or it may be that there's different mechanisms that drive the genetics of hypertension. And so we're, we're, we're following this up. Bipolar disorder, which has been all but intractable by individual SNP-based analyses, in this single welcome trust um, analysis has several genes we need genome-wide criteria for significance, some of which replicate in just the very next day the set. So we're very excited about that. And it matters where you build your predictors. So, so looking at the correlation across two independent bipolar data sets, um, especially when you set a high threshold for the significance of the difference between cases and controls, you see much better correlation across the data sets for predictors built in cerebellum than predictors built in whole blood. And bipolar disease is about is really what goes on in the brain. So this is a, it's a powerful test, uh, directly tests molecular mechanism, reduces multiple testing burden, so more, much more power. Um, unlike other gene-based tests, you get directionality. It has lots of advantages relative to gene, direct gene expression studies because you don't have reverse causation. Um, you don't have to undergo the expense of the measurement. Um, and, and you can evaluate multiple tissues and learn about biology that way. I'm just going to give one quick example where we applied it in the bio repository in Vanderbilt University. So that's about 190,000 DNA samples linked to a high quality EMR. They've got many samples already with genome interrogation and many more will be done over the next month. But we can do hypothesis driven research. So we have this hypothesis that adverse events in people who take kinase inhibitors would arise in individuals with low constitutive expression of those kinase inhibitors. People often take them, they're cancer, anti-cancer agents, and because of somatic mutations in the tumor, some of these kinase inhibitors have greatly elevated expression in the tumor, and so giving them the kinase inhibitor makes sense. But if their constitutive expression of this gene is low in all their tissues, and you give them a kinase inhibitor, we think those are the ones at risk of adverse events. So we tested this in BioView by building predictors for these target genes and their immediate downstream effectors in subjects so slow. in subjects that were genotyped in BioView. And so just to jump to the punchline here, so in red are all the things that, that go in the right direction. But these are actually adverse events that are observed in real patients. These are not patients who took drugs. These are patients that have reduced expression of the target, and they have the same phenotypes. So, you know, in a broad sweep through uh, biomed, looking at predicted expression, so low expression of these targets, is associated with the same endocrinopathies we see in people who get drugs and have a drug-induced reduction of expression of these genes, right? So that the endocrinopathies, and dry eyes is a, is a common side effect of all the kinase inhibitors. And this was a really significant um, association. So, so we think this is a really promising method. It's in the cloud for people to use. 
and it's predict scan or predicted expression scan. And of course, the young guys in the lab were all rooting for synthetic expression scan, and you can guess where that was. So the the Sarajutex team, they're going to talk about other uh, projects that we worked on in collaboration, which are really fun for us. Um, but the, the, I'm, I'm acknowledging the GTEx team because that was a lot of the data that we presented. 